You know, I was sitting there um, as we were singing that first song, um, Christ in me is to live, to die is to gain. And I always think it's good to pay attention to who's around you, right, when you're singing certain things. It reminds me of um, when, when a friend of mine realized I was a follower of God in the way of Jesus and I was going to be a pastor. It became one of those occasions to ask all questions about Christianity, right? And the first question was, she was like, why, why do you guys have to drink blood, right? Don't get scared, Winnie. Um, but I was appreciative of Tina and Winnie sitting next to me this morning because as we're thinking, to live is Christ. Christ in me is to live, to die is to gain. And I was thinking, huh, what a weird thing that Winnie and Tina might go home and tell your parents today about, like, they told us dying is a good thing, right? Um, and I thought, hmm, I'm not exactly going to preach about that today, but I hope somebody will connect with Winnie and Tina today um, to talk a little bit more about what this, what this statement of Paul, Paul is a person that said this and wrote this, is all about. But I also thought about Sunday school this morning, right? And I was thinking every time we used to read letters, this isn't a gospel, this is a letter to the Philippian church. I would always have one of those Sunday, teacher, Sunday school teachers who would like roll out the, you know, this, this homemade scroll that they made. And they would do this funny thing of like pretending they're reading a letter to people. But this is a letter, friends. And so we get to be a part of um, an intimate moment today. I got a card from Wendy through John this morning, and I felt like, wow, it's kind of neat to have those moments of reading letters with each other, right? So I want to share this morning that um, some of you know Valine and Dustin. Valine is Val's older daughter, um, younger daughter's Janine back there. And I had never been to visit Valine or Dustin, but they were going to be a part of this YCVM benefit dinner planning, and so I went to visit them a couple weeks back because they were hosting our, our meeting together. Um, and I knew they lived in Hayward, and I actually thought they were living in an apartment. It wasn't until we kind of set the date and set the time that I realized that they were now living in a house. Um, and as I learned more about it, they were living in a house with their pastor, actually. So, I, you know, I, I put it into my little, what is that called, G, GPS, GPS thing. There, it, it's on Smalley Avenue, and I'm driving there, and I get off the exit. And I have to admit, as I got off the exit, I was thinking to myself, wow, this is kind of interesting. You know, I don't go to Hayward all that much. I don't really know what Hayward is like. But it was sort of just, I noticed that I noticed it was interesting, right? <laughs> that I was kind of like, huh. And, you know, it's sort of the sense of, like, what kind of neighborhood do you expect people to live in, right? And so we were driving down, and it was sort of like different stores. And it was, I have to admit, when I turned on the street, I said to myself, huh, this is kind of run down. I mean, it wasn't like some kind of fabulous neighborhood where, like, you have, like, you know, some nice driveways. There was kind of, it's the kind of neighborhood where you kind of have people that have extra cars that are no longer driven in those driveways. Right? You know what I'm saying? Um, and it's those kind of neighborhoods where you kind of have bars on the windows and kind of like the metal gates, right? And I, so I just noticed myself thinking, oh, this is interesting. So I, I happened to be the first person that got there for the meeting that night. And so um, I talked with them a little bit about it. And it was interesting. It was this house that, you know, there's like, it's like a bizarro house, but it was like a house in the, more mid, uh, in the front. Then you connected it kind of all the way back. There was like this middle section and then another house. And it was all connected, right? And so they described to me how the, their living in this house was the result of prayer. Actually, the pastor and his wife and Valine Dustin had all been praying about this possibility. Because now you see they were living two and a half blocks away from the church. Two and a half blocks away from the church. And what they were telling me was like, nobody from the church lived in that neighborhood. Nobody. Um, everybody, like here, was commuting in. And their prayer was, how can we make a difference in this neighborhood where this church is at? And so the pastor bought this funky house, right? And moved into the neighborhood and said, I will be a presence, right? And I guess shortly thereafter, I'm not quite sure what the timeline is, Valine and Dustin had shared with them that they were about to rent a place in the neighborhood because that's where God was leading them to let go of their condo, um, rent that out, and move, rent a place. And the pastor was like, hey, we have extra room. And seriously, it's like two houses connected with a secret passageway. So, um, so they moved in, 
right? And as I wandered around, they took me into the kitchen, and I saw these like big pieces of butcher paper on, on, the, on the kitchen wall. And it had this thing that said, God thoughts. And it had tons of writing all over it. And I was like, hey, what's that about, right? And then Dalin and Dustin went ahead and told me about how just two weeks before that moment, um, something like 10 young adults had spent a whole week in their house with them. I don't know sleeping where, right? Sleeping all over. Um, but the whole idea was they wanted to begin to explore intentionally what Christian community could be about. So everybody did what they usually do during the day, right? They would get up and people would go to work or they went to school. I don't know what they were doing, right? What do young adults do, huh? Right? So um, they did what they would do, but in the evenings they would come back, they would share a meal, they would do prayer walks around the neighborhood, they would have little workshops about mission, they would talk about these things, but those thoughts were the things that had come up as they were in intentional community. And so something about all of these things that they were saying to me right, began to remind me of this phrase that we read in verse 27. And I hope you have your Bibles open. Again, we're in the letter to the Philippians. I remember it like this. Gep. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. When I'm trying to look like I know what I'm doing and flipping through the Bible, right? Go past the, the Gospels and you get... Acts and Romans, and then, and then eventually you get the gift. Um, so we're in Philippians chapter 1. Don't tell them page numbers. That is cheating. People do that. <laughs> so it reminded me of this phrase as I was sitting and meditating on the scripture this week. That they were living back then had something to do with live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I don't know, so we'll think about that a little bit more. Something about the way Dustin and Valine were beginning to shape their lives and community and how they were making choices also made me think of um, the early church in Acts. And I think Becky actually preached on this not so long ago, if you keep your finger in the Philippians text and now go to Acts 2, which comes right after the Gospel according to John. That verse, I think it's something like 42, where they say... The early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had, well, this is amazing, all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute their proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill. This is interesting. Having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being healed and saved. Now, I have to say, you may not be ready to, like, move out of your apartment, sell your home, and move right back into Chinatown, right? Some of you might have thought, no, my parents were living in Chinatown. I, I grew up in Chinatown. Why should I move back to Chinatown? Right? You also are probably thinking, no, I don't really want to host 10 young people. And this whole Christian community thing, living so close together, is just not my cup of tea. But I think the question still remains for us, together as a community, because after all, Paul was writing to the community and not to individuals only. The question of this, are we living our lives in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ? Is our conduct, our way of being, our way of living something that brings honor and credit to the good news about Jesus? That's our central question today. Let's pray. Oh God, into this silence we turn our awareness back to you and pray that you might come close to us, that you might speak and move in a way that we can understand. 
and that our eyes might be open to a new possibility, a possibility that is more whole, more healing, more transformative, more inspiring to ourselves in the lives that we live. We give this time over to you, God, and pray that indeed what transpires brings glory and honor to you. We pray this in the name of our friend, Jesus. Amen. So let me, let me share a few words of background. Um, we are going to be reading the four chapters of this short, short letter, as um, Ari has already mentioned. And I invite you to actually go and do it. It literally will take you 20 minutes max. And I think we all have 20 minutes, right? So um, to go home and, and take a look at this letter. It's interesting because one of the things that people say about this letter is that this is the happiest, most joyful, and oddly the friendliest letter of Paul to any of the communities out there. Okay? So happiest, most joyful, and friendliest letter. And I think you'll definitely feel that as you read this letter, you'll get this feeling that in the midst of crazy, difficult circumstances, yet Paul is speaking from the place of joy to a community. This is one of Paul's last letters, written probably around 62 AD, and he writes this letter as he's in prison. Okay? And even though it says that he's under house arrest in Rome, I have a high doubt that he was in some kind of nice villa, you know, with that little ankle bracelet going on, because in several um, instances earlier in the chapter, he talks about chains, being bound in chains. So you can imagine the kind of feeling that he might have just by looking around to his circumstances, why in the world would this person be able to generate and experience and communicate joy? He, in fact, is awaiting a verdict of life or death. So when he talks about this idea to die is like this and to, to live is like this, he's actually faced at that very moment with that possibility, that life or death hangs in the balance for himself. And yet he writes this letter of encouragement to the community in Philippi. It's interesting because some people say that I'm sure Paul did not have favorites, right? But... He was the friendliest to the Philippians. And for some reason, um, when the Philippians offered monetary support and even sent somebody, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, something like that, <laughs> um, to help him out in Rome, he actually received it. Whereas at other times, he might say, actually, um, I will not receive because I don't want to be beholden to you. Right? But he felt like that there was sort of a no-strings-attached kind of giving from the Philippians, and so he received it. And the letter begins with these words of greetings, saying that he remembers them, and every time he thinks of them, he feels joyful. Pastor Chuck said, That's a, that gives us some homework to do, doesn't it? Because it reminds us that we should be thinking of one another often and praying for each other. That praying for ourselves is good, but praying for each other is even better. Right? So I think of that and offer it to you today. So there are really three questions that I want to ask you to share about and talk with each other about. I want to be especially attentive to the fact that there are young people amongst us, and so if you want to move so that um, folks can have meaningful conversations with young and older alike, that would be great. So the first question that I want to, we have this letter, right? But then we have this question that comes before us, and I want us to begin to look at together. What does living life worthy of the gospel look like, actually? Right? It struck me that Valine and Dustin were doing something about it, but what to you does that mean? Worth, uh, I want to say this one thing is, worth starts getting into images of a scale. Right? You know those balancing scales and like what's heavier? And worth begins to talk about if Christ, the good news of Christ, are one side, our lives would be on the other and it would balance out. That's being worthy of this other thing. So I want to stop and just ask you, what does that actually look like concretely when you think about your life, each other's life, our life as a community? Okay? So have a conversation with two, at most three other people. I'll give you about a minute and a half and then call you back. Ready? Set, go.
You guys want to go there and they can't free. You guys can have free. Thank you for talking with folks. What, what were some things that kind of percolated up? You can stay in the seat, Brenda, because there's more questions to come. Unless you're getting exercise, that's what <laughs> What percolated? What came up? What were some thoughts that you had about? We had some amazing insightful things. Would you like to share? <laughs> That sounds like a Burt move <laughs> to me. So this, this idea that one of the hallmarks, maybe the markers of living lives worthy of the gospel is that we are no longer like some self-absorbed individual being able to only think of ourselves, but it somehow it connects us immediately into a wider network of people and creation. What you said. What, what you said. I'm just paraphrasing. Okay. So that's interesting that that's a marker. Peggy, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So in some ways, it, it reminds me of the word. I don't quite understand this word fully, but sometimes we describe the sense of altruism, right? But I sometimes think about it as the generosity of the spirit, right? We're not doing things because we're calculating like, oh, this will look good on my resume. I do so much community service and I can get into a good college or, um, or I'm doing this because it's just so great and other people will think I'm great if I do it. But really, there's a sense that, that I've been called. Maybe, and if I were to connect it back to um, our, our opening hymn, that it's actually a response to grace, right? From our hearts that we're doing these things. I just add on. Thank you. So it, it helps us think beyond ourselves. It, there's something about the heart that's motivated. And my amazing husband back there, yes. So it's interesting, right? We, I, it, that makes me think of the um, when we talked about rest not too long ago. The sense of like living lives worthy of the gospel has something to do with spaciousness and time, too. That that can affect it, too. Thank you. So we have time, heart, relationality, connectivity, other things that came up. So it's interesting. Paul begins to call them, right? He's talking to the Philippians. He said how much he loves them. And he says the most important thing. He says only. In all these different translations, there's all these ideas. And above all else, this is what you do. Live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he says this. One of his markers, right, is that we would have unity. And so if you look in verse 28 and 29, the further part of 27, he talks about, so that whether I come to see you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. So I want to ask the second question. Why do you think he didn't talk about being connected to other people or coming from the heart or, or that sense of time? Why do you think for Paul, he said, unity would be a marker of our living lives worthy of the gospel. What does unity have to do with anything? Okay? Would you mind talking about that for... You can just think out loud. There's no right answer, but think out loud and see what you come up with in a minute and a half.
feedbacks? All right, so this is a why question. We had a, like, what does it look like? Why, why is unity um, perhaps a mark of living lives worthy of Christ? Anybody have thoughts? Was this a little bit of a harder question? Yeah, yeah that fell. Was everybody able to hear Val? So um, let me lift up some things that I'm hearing you say, because this is all the background that I didn't know, right? But it's interesting, because the things that she was sharing is nine people got together to pray about this calling to come and live in the community where the church was. And that when the time came, because they were praying about it, that sense of one-heartness that you were talking about coming from the heart, but one-heartness enabled it to move into action, right? And it makes me think about maybe unity is a mark of living life worthy because it's not an easy path, right? What Valine and Dustin did, leaving their condo to come move into sort of a, I mean, not the nicest neighborhood with all kinds of, you know, things that go with that that we know about, take some courage, friends, right, doesn't it? Choosing to come from the heart and not choosing for yourself, thinking and relationally and slowing your life down, are things that take courage. And perhaps we need unity. We need to be praying with others so that when we see the opportunity arise, we know we're doing it not alone. We have people that can spur us on as well as call us to account. Thanks, Val. Are there other thoughts that came up around why might unity? Yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is side by side, right? Those words are even used in the text today. Side by side, striving together. Imagine the strength that comes from that. Imagine what you're able to do when you are in unity, right? And I want to go back to the point that Ari was making earlier today. I've been really struck time and time again by sometimes not that we do things so that other people outside will think one thing or a different thing about us, but I think again and again, the mark for me, right, the standard for me is why would somebody want to become a part of a community that doesn't have unity, that is struggling with each other, that is infighting, that can't get it together, right? Why would someone want to hear about the gospel of Christ when you who say you believe do not live up to and worthy of it, right? So we begin to think about, wow, this isn't just about me, this is about the transformation of the world. There was one more question, and I'm going to just share it with you, and I'm going to let it go. We're not going to talk about this. Paul talks about this idea in the last verse that we read today, actually in uh, the 29. He says, For he, God, has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. And I just wanted to have been thinking about this question. How and might those who live lives worthy of the gospel end up suffering? We know Paul did, right? We know Paul did, certainly. We know lots of other people, warriors in the way, who have also suffered. But how might that become a mark, and why might suffering be a part of the path that we too are called to? I want to end there today by just calling us, Paul's challenging the church, really just so that our lives make sense. Right? In some ways, it's a simple message to say that don't say one thing and then do another. Have alignment in your life. Don't say I'm a person that follows Jesus, but then when it comes down to it, like Jesus is here and we're like here. Right? Bring it together. Bring alignment. Make your life make sense. Be a part of that striving. 
And that goal that we have, that heart that we have to grow, take out your messenger on the bottom there, what does it say? One of our goals this year, that our intentionality priorities is to grow, not only deepening our spirituality, but we were hoping that this, the, the people around us would multiply. In Acts, we remembered that when we are aligned, when we are living lives worthy of the gospel of Christ, we grow. That's just one of the things that happens. So I want us to pause for a moment. I have a bunch of pink papers up here somewhere. I'm going to give it to you, and we're going to move on. Seems odd to do that. Take one and pass it out, Jonathan, if you would. Can't, if you would do the same. And this is just my question that I want to leave with you with. If you feel like you have time to mull over it now, mull over it now. If you feel like you want to take it with you, talk about it in small groups, bring it back to Sunday school, however, right? Have community to talk about it. But the question I want to ask is, what is the next step for you? Right? You, Jonathan. You, Ed. You, Arlene. You, John. Right? What is the next question for you to take? as you strive to live lives worthy of the gospel. Right. Let's take a few moments and um, we'll let it, and I'll invite us into a prayer. If you want to pray about that for a little bit, if you have something, you can offer it up during offering today. You can take it home with you. All kinds of different ways for the word to be lived out in our daily lives. Thanks for the gift of living those lives, for the gift of every day starting anew, for the grace that carries us through, knowing that we aren't doing it by ourselves, but with the grace of God. I invite you to stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another.